Amen. All right. Jenny, can you come grab this? Praise the Lord. Oh, amen. You can bring me down just a little bit. So some of you may know that the reason that we're in the Family Life Center tonight is because we are continuing or finishing up uh, the last part of our lighting project. And so we're adding more lights to the sanctuary so that the light coverage is adequate and appropriate and like what we had before. So, um, and I think you'll be very pleased that once, we'll be back in the sanctuary on Sunday. Um, so I think you'll be very pleased. It's, it's going to look really, really good. So we really thank the Lord for that. And uh, sometimes you just have to, well, one thing I thank the Lord for is, is having a place to come, right? Having a place to come, amen. And so, um, so I thank God for that. And I thank God also that the Lord prepared harvest for COVID prior to COVID, right? Well, we had the ability to live stream. We had the ability to, to broadcast from, from home, from the church, and from the Family Life Center. And so now we're able to still broadcast the, the live stream service uh, from our Family Life Center. I thank God for that. And I thank God for you. Can you give yourselves one more hand? Amen. All right. And then the other thing I'd like to do is I'd like to thank all of the, all of the saints. I know it wasn't just the brothers, but Brother Harold kind of led up the brothers and all of the saints that helped make sure that we were able to set up the Family Life Center on short notice on Sunday to make sure that we're able to have Bible study in here tonight. Thank God for those of you who are joining us online. And I think it's time to get into this word. Sister Finley, did you, you did our memory verse, didn't you? So we have done our memory verse. Um, I'll ask an easy quiz question then. This is an easy question now. Sister Dupree, where does our memory verse, what scripture, where does it come from? You don't have to quote it. You get a gold star. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, most of you know that we're in a series right now on the fundamentals of prayer, the fundamentals of prayer. So we're going to continue that series tonight. Uh, I want you to have your Bibles, your electronic devices, a pen, some paper, because you know how I am. I'm going to give you some points that I want you to be able to go and study. I'm going to give you several scriptures that I'm going to want you to use to pray out of because the, the objective of this series is to increase our prayer life. It's so that we will go to higher heights and deeper depths in prayer. Tonight, the title of the Bible study is Getting What I Want. Getting What I Want. That's the title of our Bible study tonight, all right? So I want you to keep that in mind, and we'll see how that pans out as we have Bible study tonight. Please don't forget that last week, we, we, and we had a great Bible study last week, and we were talking about the three things that you had to know. You must know about prayer, and we said that number one, we said God's purpose was much more important than our, than our plans. Very good, than our plans. That was the first point that we gave last week because everything God does, he does it and it's driven by his purpose and his plans, not our purpose and our what? And our plans. And I think sometimes as saints, as Christians, as believers, we get confused a little bit because we think sometimes that this Bible and the Lord that we serve is, uh, is there to serve us. But, but don't worry, we're, we're getting that all together with our prayer life. So that was one of the points last week. Another point that we learned last week was that God placed his word above even himself, right? And we looked at several scriptures that showed that the Lord himself said, I have placed that my word above my own name. And, and really what that simply meant was that he is going to, he's not going to do anything that's going to break his word. And if he said it, he would do it. He is not slack concerning his, concerning his promises, and he is not a God that he should lie. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we want to always remember that when we pray. And then the last point was that God would never break or violate his word. All right? All right, so let's, let's get into this week's Bible study because there, there are quite a few things I want to challenge us with this week. I want to see, as I was studying this week, I wanted, to, I wanted to place myself in the Word so that I could place you in the Word, right? Because anytime you read your Bible, the thing that you want to do is place yourself where? In the Word of God. It's absolutely no good to read about King David, to read about Abraham, to read about Moses, and it's just a an abstract story, and it has nothing to do with us. 
We must be able to place ourselves in the Word of God, put our feet in the footsteps of the Bible characters. Amen? So, I want to I wanna make sure I, I, I teach about prayer, and I want to encourage you that I'm not teaching you about prayer because, because most of you don't know how to pray or that you should pray. All right? I'm not, that's not... I'm not trying to be an elementary school teacher and act like you don't know that you should pray or that most of us know even the Father's Prayer or the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy, thy kingdom, thy will be. See, you know that, right? You know that. Kaya knows that. So that's not why I'm I'm teaching this lesson. I want to make sure that I remind us of what's good. You remember in the Bible, the Lord would always tell the children of Israel, rehearse this in the ears of your children. Right? He said, you remember, we crossed across the Jordan River. He said, I want you to go back to the middle of the Jordan. I want you to put 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan as a memorial to the 12 tribes of Israel that have crossed across the Jordan through this miracle. He said, and then after you get across and the river closes back up, rehearse this in the ears of your children. Amen. So that's what we're doing. We're rehearsing. We're rehearsing. Um, And then sometimes, even though we might know something is right and good, we don't always apply it. I know I should make my bed up in the morning. But nevertheless, I don't. Right? My thought is, hey, I'm about to get back in it in about eight hours. Right? But my wife likes to make the bed up. Right? But I was taught to do that. But I don't do that. But with the Word of God, we do that sometimes. We know that we're supposed to pray. We know that we're supposed to read our Bible. Sometimes we may not do it, okay? But just remember this. In order for um, prayer, now we're getting into your prayer life. In order for prayer to be effective in anybody's life, in anybody's life, there are a couple of things that you have to believe, all right? So this Sunday, I don't know if you remember, but if you were here, Bishop Watson told us that, that it's not a... Right? It's not, it, it, being saved is not a feeling. Faith is not a feeling. Feelings are good, but, but faith, he said, was, is believing that Jesus has destroyed all the power of Satan or that, Satan ha- that the enemy has against us. Right? That's faith. That's what we're supposed to believe. And so faith is all about believing and prayer is all about believing. So we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Okay. Um, here's what I want to do. I understand, here's what I want you to believe. Let me say it this way. I want you to believe that this world is not the end. This is not the only world. We're not talking about aliens and spaceships. Those of us who are spiritual believers, we know and we understand that this life is simply the beginning of eternal life. This is where we start. Because we know that, the, that, that, that even as we watch television, people on television even believe that there's another life. I was watching a show recently, and the, the man said in the show, he said, when I go into the afterlife, when I go into the afterlife, now, you and I know it's not called the what? We know it's not called the afterlife. But you know what that tells you? that tells you that the unbeliever believes there's another world. There's another life. You know that's true because October 31st just passed. Right? And October 31st, that's all about um, demons and wickedness and um, they wouldn't even make horror movies if they didn't believe in another life, another world. Right? And it's the supernatural. So prayer is all about the supernatural. And so, so, here, I, so I'm thinking that you and I want what we do on earth to affect what takes place in heaven. Okay? The believer, that's what we want. Um, and even though the unsaved know that there's another world, they're not thinking about heaven where the believer, we're supposed to think on these things daily, all of the time, e- every day. Because there's a natural realm and there's a spiritual realm. The natural realm is the realm we live in and walk in. The natural realm is the flesh that you live in. 
The natural realm is the, the offense that's taken when somebody says something to you that rubs you the wrong way. The natural realm, you always know when you're in the natural realm because the natural realm always brings contention. Contention and strife, right? Because there's no contention, there's no strife in heaven. So you know, you're, you know we're, we're right here. So when we're in the natural realm, we have to learn to pray. And so the Bible says this about the natural realm and the spiritual realm. The Bible calls the natural realm the terrestrial realm. And it calls the, calls the spiritual realm the celestial realm. So if you have your electronic device or your Bible, go to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter and the 39th verse. 1 Corinthians 15 and 39. All right. When you get there, please say amen. 1 Corinthians 15 and 39. And the Bible says, all flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. Verse 40. There are also celestial bodies, that means heavenly bodies, and bodies terrestrial, that means earthly bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So I just simply showed you that to show you that there are, there's two worlds, right? There's a, there's a celestial world, there's a, that is the spiritual world, and there's a, a terrestrial world, that is the natural world. And when you pray, you have to pray with these two worlds in mind, Right? So here's the first point. The first point you should write down is this. Prayer is a terrestrial license for celestial influence. Prayer is a terrestrial license for celestial influence. Let me explain that to you. Very simply, prayer is man giving heaven a license to interfere on earth. That's what we're doing when we pray. We're we're praying, hoping that the Lord will interfere in our matters, in our circumstances, in our relationship. We're praying so that heaven will move on our behalf, right? What, What good does it do anyone to pray to the Father when we never intend on giving him any permission to act on our behalf? Does that, even, that doesn't even make any sense for someone to pray and then not expect God to move on their behalf. It would be like having a primary care physician, your doctor, he, you go in, you take three hours off of work, you sit in his office, you wait for 45 minutes, you see him for 15. He gives you this valuable advice about cholesterol, about nutrition, about whatever else he has to do. He prescribes you some medicine, gives you some advice, and then you refuse to take the advice. You just paid all that money so you could not take the advice. That's what it's like to pray to a God who's got all power, but then we not take the advice. P- prayer is like, is like having an attorney, but then never taking the counsel of the attorney or never taking him to court when you have a need. You just have him. You're just paying the, what's it called, a retainer. That's what prayer is like if you, if you do not take counsel from the Lord, right? If you don't take counsel from the Lord. That, if you go to court without your attorney, that is self-destructive. That's crazy to do that. It's crazy. And if you think about it, who can represent man in spiritual matters better than God? Right? Who, 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 can, who can answer your prayer better than the Lord? Who can do what you need done better than the Lord? Anybody ever heard of a power of attorney? A power of attorney. A prayer, here's the point. Prayer is God's power of attorney. He said, well, Pastor Rob, what's, what's a power of attorney? A, a power of attorney is real simple. A power of attorney is simply a document that gives someone else uh, full authority to operate on your behalf. It gives someone full authority, it grants them full authority to to, to work for you in legal matters and in natural matters. Prayer is God's power of attorney. 
But the question is, is how many saints have given God a power of attorney? Like, how, I, I, <laughs> I wonder how many of us have, because have, here's what prayer does. My wife and I have, power, we've done power of attorneys many times. You know, when you're in the military, you should do that so that your wife can handle the business while you're in another country or that the hus- so that the husband can handle the business when you're in another country. And it, it really means that you surrender all of your rights in that matter. If you give someone power of attorney over your bank account, you've given them full right and authority to handle business on your behalf because you're in another country. You just have to throw your hands up and say, I hope they do me right. I'm, I'm praying, Lord Jesus, don't let, her, don't let him lose his mind when I'm in this country. Some of us who've been in the military and you serve in certain positions, there are all kind of things that happen with people who are deployed. You can't even make up these stories. All kind of things happen and they come back and there's no home, no bank account, no nothing left because they've given someone a power of what? A power of attorney. They freely surrendered. Now let me say this to you. You and I ought to give God a power of attorney and freely surrender all rights to the matter we're praying about. Uh. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I freely give you this matter. You know what I always tell you to pray? I say, here's how you pray about something that you can't control. You say, Father, in Jesus' name, I commit this thing, whatever, you name it, I commit this into your hands for your leading for your guiding and for your safekeeping every day. That's what you pray about that matter. When that person is, 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 is uh, 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 persecuting you and you can't do anything about it, you say, Lord, I commit so-and-so into your hands for your leading, for your guiding, and for your safekeeping. Father, I, I don't have the job yet, but Lord, I'm up for this promotion and there's three of us there considering. I, I c- c- commit this job into your hands for your leading, for your guiding, and for your for your safekeeping. And I will tell you, if you will give God the power of attorney concerning that thing, he will move on your behalf because he's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. So that's what you have to ask yourself. Does God have a power of attorney on my behalf? Right? Yeah. How many times have we prayed? Because I, I know I have said, Lord, you can... Lord, I give this to you. You can do this for me, Lord. I, I, it's in your hands, Lord. I, I, I take my hands off the steering wheel. But how many times have we prayed? How many times have we gotten on our knees, cried, begged, sniffled, snotted all over the pillow, the couch, and the chair, and then when we get up, we get up. Now, keep in mind, we just finished begging God for an hour to do a particular thing for us, but when we get up, we keep our hands on the steering wheel. Have you ever, you ever seen somebody who's about to get into an accident and they, they tell you it's better to be asleep when you get into a, an accident because your body's completely relaxed. And when your body's completely relaxed, it just goes with the flow. So if you get thrown around in the car, then the, the, you, it's, you're less likely to tear a ligament or break a bone because you're in a relaxed state. But people who tense up, they're the ones who tear ligaments and break bones. That's why drunk people usually come out of accidents halfway decent. But I would not advise you. <laughs> you just, just stay out of accidents. Just, just stay out of accidents. But how many times have we prayed and then we get up and we keep our hands on the steering wheel? We keep flying the plane. We, 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 we keep the reins of our lives in our own hands after we've said, Lord, you have the power of attorney. And people do it all of the time. And because we're free moral agents, guess what? When we keep our hands on the steering wheel, guess what the Lord does? You got it. Anybody in the Navy or was in the Navy here? If you're in the Navy, there's, there's an expression. Like when, uh, when I was in the Navy and we did, we did these, these training drills, you'd come, up, you'd come up to the ship. If you're going to drive the ship and you're going to take over for the person who's driving, they would say, um, Lieutenant so oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Lieutenant so-and-so has the helm. And then I would step up to the helm, and then I would say, 
I have the helm. Is that true? That's what you do. But you know what we do? God has the helm. And then the Lord said, no, I don't. Because you're still holding on to it. That's <laughs> don't people do that all the time? And don't answer this, but I wonder how many of us have gotten tired of holding on to the helm. Gotten tired of leading and guiding our own life. We've gotten tired of ruling our own life, of, of reigning over our own life. I wonder how many of us have gotten tired of being our own God. So what am I going to do? What do I do when I get tired? I've done it. What do I do when I get tired of not letting go of the helm? That's when I go to James, the fourth chapter in the seventh verse. That's when I have to surrender. James, the fourth chapter and the seventh verse, it, it simply says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. It says, resist the devil and he'll flee, but the first part is the part we want. Submit yourselves. Let me just tell you what the word submit means. It means surrender. Can somebody say surrender? surrender. It, means, it means surrender yourself. It means uh, 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 subject yourself to. Humble yourself to surrender. What does the song say? I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All. Jesus said in Matthew, the 16th chapter, he sa it says in 16 and 24, then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him de deny, deny himself, de deny himself. But here's the best part. In the next verse, in verse 25, Jesus says, the reason you want to surrender, or the reason you want to give me the power of attorney, he said, because for whosoever, verse 25 says, for whosoever will save his life, will lose it. Whoever holds on to the helm is going to crash. Whoever holds on to the steering wheel will have a bad accident. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But then it says, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And then one of your favorite verses is Proverbs 3 and 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths, right? That means let go of the steering wheel. That's what that means. That's what that means. So if you think that, if you think that it's impossible to surrender, which I don't think we, we don't think that. It's not because Jesus was our example and Jesus surrendered. Right? He surrendered his entire life. He, he told his disciples, he told his disciples one time, they said, well, Jesus, they said, you haven't eaten in a long time. Aren't you hungry? He said, oh, I've got meat that you, that you know not of. They said, well, then the scripture actually says they thought that he had eaten something while they were gone. But then Jesus said to them, he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Okay, I think that's where so many saints get off. Because Pastor Rob 1 and 1 says, my will is to do the will of Pastor Rob and to accomplish the work of Pastor Rob according to his will. Right? Don't most people think that way? My will is to get what I want. My will is to, to get what I want when I want it, because you know it's a Wendy's generation. I want it when I want it, and I want it right now. And if you take too long, I'm going to get out of line and go to another store. Don't let the, 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 the drive through line be too long. Oh, don't go to Burger King, and, and, and you have to wait two car lengths. Right? That's why you stand in line at Harris Teeter and at Walmart and you look to see which line is the shortest and then you're gauging yourself as to which line you're going to get in. And then if you get in one line, you sit there and watch that person who would have been you <laughs> to see if they beat you to the cash register. Listen, let go of the steering wheel. Just let, let go. It 
It does hurt. It does hurt when they get there first. <laughs> you see, and then, and then here's the spirit, and this is what the, the, the spirit-filled brother goes. The spirit-filled brother goes, the Lord told me to get in that line. The Lord didn't, the Lord. The Lord ain't, the Lord ain't concerned about that. The Lord ain't concerned about that. Well, listen. <laughs> so how are you supposed to surrender? We're supposed to surrender the way we did at 6 p.m. tonight. On our knees where? In prayer. Why? Because last week I told you that the most effective fighting position for every believer is a kneeling position. Did you know that most snipers are, are most um, effective when they're either in a kneeling position or a lying position? They either lie flat on their belly or they're in a kneeling position. One of the reasons you're most effective, now don't take my advice, but if anybody ever breaks into a home and you know they're coming in and you have a weapon, don't stand up when he comes through the door. Kneel, because he's not looking down. And by the time he sees you, double tap. No, I'm just kidding. 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 <laughs> just get an alarm system. Amen. <laughs> but the interesting thing is this. So many of us, we think that we've surrendered to God. Let me tell you why. We think we've surrendered to the Lord because he answers our prayer. You've been praying about something for a while, a long time. Lord, will you do this for me? Lord, make this happen. Lord, move this. Make this happen. Make this come to pass. Open this door, Lord. Then it comes to pass. It happens. So you must have surrendered. You must be spiritual. You must have done something right because now you have God's favor. Right? But can I tell you that just because your answer comes doesn't mean God answered it. Uh-oh. Because we have an enemy. He's the enemy of our soul, right? And what he does is he will use our desires, he will use our affections, he will use our emotions, he will use our own will against us. How many of you know there have been many a people that have wanted to, to become very talented in the in the uh, the world and become an entertainer or whatever it may be, God, the, the enemy will anoint them and then they will get out there and do whatever they do, but there's always a price to be paid. And, and, and we use terms like, he sold his soul to the, to the devil. She sold her soul to the devil. I was telling you, maybe it wasn't you, but I was telling my wife a couple of months ago about a, a professional athlete who was talking about his success, and he's won multiple, multiple Super Bowls. And he was talking about his success, and he was attributed his success to his wife. And the interviewer dug into that and said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, years ago, after we lost our first Super Bowl, he said, my wife told me that if I would do this, this, and this, that I would be successful the next year. And then he, the interviewer said, well, what did you do? He said, I did what she said. And so he said the next year he did what she said, they won the Super Bowl. Then she said to him, if you do this, this, and this, this year, you'll win again. Boom, back-to-back -back Super Bowls. Then he said, then she told me after that season, uh, he, oh, he said he went to her after that, that game, and he said, uh, babe, what do you see for the next year? <laughs> you hear what I said? Yeah. What do you see for the next year? Yeah. And she said to him, it doesn't look good. He said, it doesn't look good. She said, no, next year won't be your year. She said, but if you do what I tell you to do, the year after will be your year. And he said his wife would bring to his locker every game, would bring um, altars, um, idol, little idol gods, and put them in his locker and burn incense and, and, and have these uh, potions and stuff. And she, he said she was at home making these things for him. And, and then she said, he said the, the, that next year they lost in the Super Bowl. But the year after that they won it again. 
Then he said to the interviewer, he said, he said, he didn't say I thank God. He said, um, he said, it's a good thing I'm married to a witch. He said, it's a good thing I'm married to a witch. And the interviewer said, excuse me? He said, oh yeah. He said, my wife said to me, aren't you so glad you're married to a witch? She said, but I'm a good witch. There's another world out there. So just because your prayer is answered doesn't mean it was answered by God. Somebody say surrender. <laughs> the devil will make us think that God is pleased when the prayer gets answered. The devil will make us think that we've surrendered. The devil will make us think that we have denied ourselves, picked up our cross, and followed God. The devil will make us think that God now has the power of attorney in our life just because one prayer gets gets answered, but in actuality, all that's really happened is that we worked every angle we could. We made every contact we could make. We uh, went down every avenue we could go down because that's what we really wanted. Called everybody we knew. Called in every favor we could call in until it came to what? Till it came to pass. So, uh, brother, uh, do you know so and so? Yeah, I know so and so. Can you give them a call? So, so, can I, what about so and so? Yeah, can you give it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, can you put in a good word for me? So and so, so. Now, keep in mind, you're also praying, saying, "Lord, I need you to do this for me." Lord, I want you to. Lord, Pastor Rob said, "I commit this into my hands." <laughs> into your hands for your leading and for your guiding and for your safekeeping. But remember, we're still holding on to the helm. But at the same time, we're in the background making every contact, making every phone call, doing what we, I've done it. Oh, Lord, I've done it. And then we say, oh, the Lord has given me favor. He brought it to pass. When in actuality, guess who brought it to pass? You brought it to pass. You know, God doesn't always bless you with that car. You can go buy a car. He doesn't always bless us with the house. Anybody can buy it. Anybody can go into debt. That's not a miracle. That's a curse. You know what a, you know what a miracle is? Somebody giving you a, a house for a dollar. That's a miracle. We have, we have, my wife and I have a friend, she's a pastor in uh, S South Carolina, and she was a friend of another pastor of a church, and that church, something happened, it disbanded. Do you know, they gave that lady that, they gave our friend this brand new beautiful church for a dollar. Because they legally could not give it away for free. So they gave it to her for a dollar. And the reason I know this to be true is because they needed to, to give it to a um, 501c3 tax exempt organization and we had our, our 501c3 and she needed to use ours in order to get it. A dollar. Somebody say, that's a miracle. <laughs> that's a miracle. That's a mi you, yeah, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. But don't you bring to pass the answer, right? And have you noticed this? I, I might be the only one, but I don't think I am. I can't tell you how many times I've tried to pray myself out of an un uncomfortable circumstance. I've tried to pray myself out of a, a job that I didn't like. I've tried to pray myself out of a, a, a friendship that was just getting on my last nerve. I've tried to pray myself out of circumstances and situations that were just, it just didn't seem like the Lord. Just to try to pray myself out of it. Say, Lord, I don't, I don't like my supervisor. Lord, I don't like this position. And Lord, I need you to move me. Now, keep in mind, I begged him for the job. I prayed for two years committing this into your hands for your leading and for your guiding and your safekeeping. Then he gave me the job. Then two weeks later, I complain about the job that I say he gave me. And that one, maybe he did give me. But what we don't realize is so many times, so many times, 
So many times God is trying to use that circumstance, that relationship, that situation, that job, that uncomfortableness, that awkwardness. He's trying to use that to bless you. He's trying to use that to teach you something. Oh, my God. And then the funny thing is we're trying to pray our way out of the blessing. We're trying to pray our way out of the lesson. We're trying to pray our way out of the growth. How many of you know, if you would leave it up to children, they would not amount to hardly anything. You have to teach them to make that bed. You have to teach them to say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. You have to teach them to save money. You have to teach them how to open a bank account. You have to teach them how to invest. You have to teach them that they need to invest in property. You, come on, somebody. If you don't teach them, who's going to teach them? Do you know what this world wants to teach our children? They want to teach them how to go to jail. No, you, you, my friend, you, you have to teach them. And guess what? A lot of those lessons aren't easy. The reason my daughter knows how to play the piano today is because I taught her how to play the piano. Now, she plays way better than I do, but I remember all of the days that she didn't want to practice. And I would have to say, listen, I would always have to kind of bribe her. I said, listen, if you get your, get your practice in, and we'll go get some ice cream. Get your practice in, and we'll go do something you want to do. But guess what I had to do? I had to teach her. You have to teach children discipline. They'll eat cat and cotton candy all day long if you don't teach them. So growing up, uh, when my daughter was growing up, there, I had changed my diet, so there's a lot of things that I wasn't eating. I wasn't doing this, wasn't doing that. So there wasn't milk in the house. There wasn't all this stuff. And, uh, and so I, would always, I always had healthy stuff in the house, apple juice and stuff and fruit and all this other stuff. And uh, now my wife, she'd eat whatever she wanted to eat. But when my daughter was homeschooled, so she was with me a lot, so she, so she ate pretty much what I ate. And now I notice that I'll come home, all my applesauce will be gone out of the, out of the refrigerator. All my nuts will be gone. All my, whatever it is, they'll be gone. But, but you know what? Oh, well, my baked lays, I like the baked lays now. <laughs> but here's the thing. You know what I tell myself? I would much rather her eat up all my applesauce than eat the Baconator every single day, right? Just go, girl, eat up all my nuts. Just eat them up, right? Because that's a good habit, right? That's a good habit. So we, you have to teach our children good habits, all right? Teach our children. And then so we try to pray our way out of the blessing of God. And here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand that every, uh, every awkward situation, every uncomfortable situation, every painful situation is not the devil. Because remember, we're trying to pray our way out of a blessing, pray our way out of a teaching, out of a lesson. How many of you know this? How many of you know that there, I have not yet actually found a Bible account where God asked someone to do something great that they wanted to do. Show me where Abraham wanted to leave all of his relatives in Ur of Chaldees and go off to somewhere that he didn't even know where he was going. He was just wandering out in the desert. Nobody! Show me where Moses wanted to go talk to Pharaoh. That man had, we always said, that man had PTSD. He was out in the desert for 40 years hiding for his life. No, he didn't want to go talk to Pharaoh. Show me where, where, where King David wanted to fight Saul. He didn't want to fight Saul. He wouldn't even touch the man. So what I want to tell you is this. Oh, you know, do you remember Noah? Show me in the Bible where Noah wanted to build an ark and look crazy for 125 years. Here's, here's why it's crazy. It had never rained. So, so in other words, you're building a boat to go in water, but there's no water. It, had, it hadn't rained for 125 years. You think he wanted to do that? You think he wanted to be ostracized and be an outcast? Listen, whatever it is, I'm, I'm going to tell you this, I'm going to tell you this, I want to tell you this. Just know this. This is why I'm teaching this. The reason I'm teaching this is because eventually every person who claims the name of Jesus is going to be asked by God to do something you don't want to do. At, 
There are no exceptions. Every person who's living saved will be asked by God to do something you don't want to do. That is why I do not subscribe to this new Christendom thing where everybody in the church just, they only volunteer for what they want to do. Say, what? What if your kids only did that in your house? Would the bathroom ever get clean? Would the dishes ever get washed? Would the bed ever get made? No, somebody's got to clean, be on the custodial staff. Someone has to be a greeter. Someone has to vacuum. The, in fact, I need to vacuum this carpet tonight. Somebody has got to do some of the work that everyone does not want to do. But let me tell you why God asks you to do things that you don't want to do. is because he's training you to know how to do ministry. Amen. I used to be an usher when I first joined the church. I was 21 years old. The Lord saved me. I was, so, uh, I was just so grateful to be saved. Listen, nowadays people aren't as grateful as we used to be. You know what I mean, Sister Tanya? When we first got saved, people, um, you, they would do whatever you asked them. You just, um, can, you, yeah, can you take out the trash? Can you, can you oh yeah, wait, what you need me to do? What you need me to do? It just, so the Lord saved me. They say, hey, can you be an usher? I said, of course, whatever, the, whatever you want me to do. I hated ushering. Oh my God. It was horrible. Because you had to stand up the entire service. And in Pentecost, I was in Pentecostal church. So it, it wasn't like Catholic church. It wasn't like you sit down, stand up. You stood up the whole service. And then service could be one hour, two hours, five hours. You stood up the whole service. And you have white gloves and all that. So my back would start hurting. My knees would hurt. And I just thought, this is Horror. I didn't want to usher, but I didn't want to tell the Lord what? No. And then one day, I'm standing on the usher, leaning against the wall because my back is hurting, and the pastor gets up and he says, and he tells the usher president, he says, uh, he says, ma'am, sister so-and-so, he says, uh, don't put any of the musicians on the usher schedule because we need them to play. So guess what my next desire was? <laughs> Can I be a musician? And I think that next week I was up there trying to learn how to play the keyboard. But do you know why the Lord allowed me to be an usher and not say no? It's because now I have compassion on ushers and greeters. I know what it's like to greet people who you don't know at the door when they come in. I know what it's like to smile when you don't feel like smiling. I know what it's like to say praise the Lord when you don't feel like saying praise the Lord. What it's like to say how are you doing when you don't feel well. I know what that's like. I know what that's like. I have compassion on that now. But if I had said no, my pastor used to teach a Bible study in Jackson, Mississippi. We lived in, I lived in Biloxi, Mississippi. The church was in Biloxi. The Bible study was in Jackson, Mississippi, three hours away. My pastor gets up over the pulpit. He says, would any, any of the brothers mind driving me to Jackson on a Thursday night, on a, on a Wednesday night? Without thinking, I'll do it. Now, I didn't raise my hand because I like to drive. I, rose my, I raised my hand because I wanted to spend time with the pastor. I hated driving. But every Wednesday for two years, me and another brother, uh, Brother Jay, James, we would drive Pastor, pastor Bruner from Biloxi, Mississippi to Jackson, Mississippi. He would, for three hours, he would teach a one-hour Bible study at a college at Jackson State, we would drive him back home. We'd get home at about two in the morning, and then we would do it all over again the next week, right? I didn't do that because I wanted to, but it trained me for ministry. It trained me to start a, a church in a Husky, North Carolina. Years later, when we were here, we started a church in a Husky, North Carolina. I knew what it meant to get in a car every week and drive an hour, hour and a half, teach a Bible study for 45 minutes and drive back home. I had already done that with my pastor. I had seen it done. God is trying to train you for ministry. So if you can at all help it, never tell God no. Because if you're telling God no, what you're saying is no to my blessing. No to my blessing. No to my blessing, all right? And, 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 and believe me, I am not trying to manipulate you into doing anything 
but I'm trying to help you be blessed. And anybody, is anybody a witness to that? That you, you didn't tell God no, and as a result, you see now what a blessing it is to you, right? Amen. Amen. All right, so let me get ready, let me get ready to finish up. Um, let me make this statement. Tr- true prayer is not getting what you want. True prayer is getting what he wants. True prayer. True prayer is not me saying, Lord, I need you to do this for me. I need you to do that for me. Lord, I want this to come to pass. True prayer is praying for what he wants. And he may want you to get your degree. He may want you to get blessed. He may want you to get that six-figure job or that seven-figure job. He may want that for you because he knows he can use you as a conduit to bless his people. God always has a purpose. Remember we read that last week? He's got a purpose. And if he can use you to be a blessing, he'll bless you. He'll bless you. He'll bless you. So that's true prayer. True prayer. Um, what when I lived in Mississippi, I was there, and, and, uh, and Pastor Yaz and I were there. She, she lived, before we, before we got married, she lived in New Orleans. Then, and then we got married, and then she lived in, in Biloxi. And um, with my two and a half, three year period of being in Mississippi, I loved my church. Oh my God, I loved my church. I loved my pastor. I loved my church. I loved the fellowship. You know, we would have skate, skate night fellowships. And see, we were sanctified, sanctified. So when we would have skate night fellowships, we didn't go on the whirly night. When we went, we rented out the arena, and then we played our music. And you know, you got Fred Hammond. Oh, y'all don't know how to skate. See, y'all know how to skate. No. So we would have Fred Hammond playing. And you know, you was you skating backwards, and you know, you do it. Oh, yeah. I love my church. Oh, we had so much fun. We had all kind of fellowships. And the services were a blessing. It just everything was great. So then the, Lord, the, the military gave me orders. And, and, and now, after three years of being at this location, I didn't want to leave. I was the secretary for my pastor. I traveled all over the world with him. And, and not that I liked carrying bags and making hotel reservations and making uh, rental car reservations. I just wanted to be near my pastor. It wasn't about, I hated doing all that stuff. I, my wife will tell you, I'm an administrative nightmare, right? So I started praying, Lord, I commit these orders into your hands for your what? Leading for your what? Guiding and for your what? Safekeeping. Lord, I know, Lord, I know you, this is not your will for my life. I commit these into your hands. But at the same time that I'm praying that at five in the morning, because we used to pray at five in the morning. We used to pray from five to seven in the morning at the church, come back at 12, pray from 12 to 2, come back at 5 and pray from 5 to 6. She said that was the marine life. But what I will tell you is, I wouldn't be who I am today if it were not for that, for that training. I don't ever complain about the Lord's hand in my life. Anytime you, you've been through something in your life, look at it for the good that came out of it. Don't say, well, uh, I couldn't stand that lady. She got on my nerves every service. No, that lady taught you how not to treat people. Amen. Don't sit there and say, I couldn't stand when so-and-so preached. Every time he preached, he always so-and-so. No, that guy to- taught you how not to preach. Amen. Right? And, and if you were in a service and it lasted six hours, you're like, oh, my God, I just hated that because we were in service too long. Listen, no, it, what that showed you was it doesn't take God six hours to do everything. Sometimes it might take them six hours, but it don't take them six hours all the time. Hey, I loved our our conventions and our conferences because those were the times when you heard the singers from all over the world and from different countries, and and still that service would last four or five hours. And you wouldn't even notice it because it was always something good happening. Something funny was happening. So, you know, folks are funny in church. And then the preaching was always really good. So, 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 so I was praying, Lord, commit, I commit this, these orders into your hands. I, I know this isn't your will, Lord. I know this isn't your way, Lord. You want me to be the armor bearer, even though I didn't use that terminology, armor bearer. That's really what I was for my pastor. And, I, and, and never self-proclaim yourself. Don't run around. Don't come up and say, I am Pastor Rob's armor bearer. Please don't say that. But if I had one, it would be Elder Harold or Brother Tony, right? 
I just don't use that terminology because I find that when people self-proclaim it, it's, it's almost a, a self-detrimental prophecy. I don't know. I've just, that's what I've seen. That's what I've seen. So anyway, I was, I was working with, for my pastor, and I didn't want to leave. And so I said, I said, I said, I said Lord, I commit this into your hands. But on the sa- at the same time, when I was on the base, I was calling everybody I knew. Colonel so-and-so, can you help me? General so-and-so, can you help me? I called San Antonio. I called my, uh, what do they call my, 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 uh, the guy who's your rep for your orders. I call my assignment guy. I call everybody. I was like, listen, can you so and so so? Can you swap somebody with me? Can you do so and so so? Can you at least give me another two years on station? I called in all my favors. I was friends with the general of the base, the base commander. She was a one star general. I went to her house. I said, General so and so. She said, oh, she said, she said, Lieutenant Robinson, I'm so glad to see you. How, how can I help you? How can I help? And she, I told him, I told her, I pleaded my case. I didn't tell her I wanted to stay because of the church, but I pleaded my case. And I said, well, can I go to the wing level, right? And she listened to my whole little sob story. And then she said, she said, well, Lieutenant Robinson, she said, I, I can't do that for you. She said, because if I did it for you, I have to do it for everybody, right? And really what that told me was I wasn't as close with her as I thought. So finally, I went back to my pastor. I said, Pastor, I said, Pastor Brunner, I, um, I've done everything I could do. I said, it's in the Lord's hands now. But I was, try- I was working that thing. And you know what the final answer was? No. And so many months later, I got sent to, to Virginia. I'm showing you that every prayer you pray that does get answered doesn't mean it's the Lord. So a couple months later, I'm in Virginia. Against my will, mind you, Abraham... Abraham Robinson, <laughs> Moses Robinson, Noah Robinson, right? And David Robinson. Hey, David Robinson. And so I, I'm in Virginia now, and the only instruction that my pastor gave me was, he gave us, he said, when you get there, he said, find a good church. He said, find a spirit-filled church to go to. He said, and start a Bible study. Because he knew that that would keep me active, studying my Bible. And so I thought to myself, oh, I could do a Bible study. I've seen him do it for three straight years. I could do a Bible study. That's okay. I, that's not a lot of responsibility. So I started the Bible study. 27 years later, Harvest Church of Hampton. This church has been, we've been I've been pastor for 27 years now. Against my will. <laughs> In other words, I didn't want the orders. I didn't want the assignment. I didn't want the blessing because I didn't think it was a blessing. I didn't want to say yes. I didn't even want to go. The Lord sent me where I didn't want to go. You know why? Because Isaiah says, but it says, so, so my word, Isaiah 55 and 11 says, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Don't you know in your life right now, God is going to ask you to do some things you don't want to do. And I would encourage you to be very prayerful before you said no. Because you could be saying no to one of the greatest blessings you've ever received. Everybody stand. So somehow in that, my title was Getting What I Want. The reason I said that is because we all think when we pray, we need to get what we want. But I told you last week, the end of all of our prayers should be, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Thy will be done. Don't forget from tonight's Bible study and that there are two different worlds, right? There's a spiritual world. There's a natural world. And, and, and prayer is a terrestrial license for celestial interference. In other words, it gives God permission to interfere in our affairs. It gives God a power of what? Power of attorney. A power of attorney. 
And it gives them a power of attorney because eventually God is going to ask you to do something you don't really want to do. But you'll look up 10 years later, five years later, 20 years later. I can't tell you how many parents have said to me, it was not our intent to have our second child or our third child or our fourth. It was not our intent. But that unintentional child ended up being the greatest blessing they ever had. That was me. I was the unintentional <laughs> child, mind you. I'm like John right now, Brother Tony. You remember John, John the Beloved? You know John the Beloved wrote about himself in John? He said, John, the disciple that Jesus loved. He said, he called himself John the Beloved. But no other gospel calls him John the Beloved except his own. So I was the un unintentional child. What I'm saying is, just don't say no to the blessing. All right. So uh, before we go into prayer, I want to ask, right now, off the top of your head, do you have a prayer request? Before we go into prayer. Sister Finley? Fearlessness. Fearlessness. Oh, come on, somebody. Fearlessness. Sister Dupree. Orders. Orders. Amen. Amen. All right. Sister, Fe Sister Maya? Her school situation. Okay. Her school. Yeah. Amen. All right. Brother Alvarez? Norman Hamble. Hamble? Hample. Norman Hample in the hospital. Amen. And I'm also lifting up harvest. Amen. I don't know if you all have, are seeing this, but the Lord is doing something in the spirit every service. He's breaking yokes. The dam is opening. And even uh, when Bishop, Bishop Watson ministered, I looked out over the congregation and the Lord is pouring out his spirit. And, 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 and I want us to be prepared for the inflow. Pre I need us to be prepared for the inflow, for the blessing that's coming, right? He said, I'll open a window of heaven and I will do what? Pour you out a blessing that you what? Won't have room to receive. And when he says that, it doesn't mean don't be prepared. And so that means he's going to need you. He's going to need you. He's going to need you. And I'm, I was saying to myself, I said, Lord, help us to be prepared. Prepared for the inflow. Because the Lord is about, he's about to blow things up. He's about to cause things to become um, an overflow of members, an overflow of people, an overflow of youth and young adults, an overflow. When we went, we went bowling in, uh, that last Saturday with the, not just the young adults, we took everybody and went bowling. And I want to tell you, we had a ball. We had a ball. I thoroughly enjoyed watching Sister Elandra hop teams at the end and get on the winning team. She stays, she's on the lower side. She's on the Lord's side. But what I'm, what I'm telling you is the Lord has been giving me glimpses of where he's taking us. And sometimes you only need to see a small glimpse. It's like, it's like a child. A, a good parent can look at their children and each child has a gift. A good parent will look and go, ooh, this one right here, he's going to be a preacher. Or a good parent will say, ooh, this one right here, he's going to be a businessman. This one over here, he's going to be a, she's going to be a talented musician. A good parent can see glimpses in their children. And then what you want to do is you want to feed that. What's it called? Cultivate. You want to cultivate that, right? You, you can see from the start. Sister Jill already knows little Kaya is a born leader. She's going to be telling somebody what to do in her company. Uh, one day I, I was talking to Sister Kaya and she saw that, that I, we were putting together a little youth group. And, um, and she, I said, uh, Sister Kaya said, can I sing with the group? I said, oh, baby, of course you can. It was a little, you know, it was a youth, it was a youth group. And she said, before I, before I finish saying, of course you can, she said, be the leader. And I said, uh, I said, well, let me pray about that. And let me see what the Lord says. You know what she said to me? I already talked to the Lord. He said, I'm the leader. <laughs> you know what I see in her? I see a glimpse of what she's going to be. Right? Amen. And I wonder how many of you have seen a glimpse, even in your own self. Let's lift our hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, Lord. 
Help me to get what you want. Help me to pray your will. And help me never to say no to my blessing. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you and we give you glory. Lord, we magnify you in the name of Jesus. We, we, we lift your name on high. There is no God like you. Beside you, there is none other. Lord, we thank you, thank you, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word, the simplicity of your word. Thank you for every hearer that's here. Lord, let us not be hearers only, but let us be doers of your word. Help us to walk in the blessing. Lord, every uncomfortable situation, help us to see your hand. Lord, every difficult circumstance, help us to see your hand. Father, every awkward moment, help us to see your hand. And Lord, in Jesus' name, right now, right now, right now, we give you power of attorney. Lord, we give you full right and authority to operate on our behalf. Lord, we, we commit our matter, whatever that matter is you have right now. Father, I commit this into your hands for your leading, whatever that relationship is. Lord, we commit this into your hands for your guiding, whatever that issue is, that personal issue is. Lord, we commit this into your hands for your safekeeping. And we ask that you would lead us and guide us. Lord, I want you to bless your people. Lord, help us to always pray true prayers. Help us to pray your will and not our will. Nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but, but your will be done. And Father, do for the saints what only you can do. Somebody needs a door open. Lord, I want you to open a door for one of the saints that only you can open. I don't know if that's Maya, but Lord, I want you to open a door for the saints that only you can open. My God. Lord, I want you to work out all legal paperwork. Every legal matter. Cause it to work in our favor. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we bless your name. And then, Lord, you've heard every prayer request for the brother that's in the hospital. You've heard the prayer request, Lord. Lord, for uh, Sister Finley. Lord, you've heard the prayer request that the saints have lifted up before the throne of grace. We ask that you would answer. But not according to our will. We give you glory. Lord, whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing at Harvest, Lord, I see the, the floodgates opening. Whatever you're doing, help us to be prepared for the blessing. Prepare every heart and every mind put our hand to the plow and then Lord we will give you glory Lord as you send in the souls we'll give you praise Father as you, as you uh, uh, cause the musician section to overflow we give you honor Lord as you cause our greeters and our ushers and our custodial Lord as you cause the finance department every area of the church Lord to, to overflow with abundance we give you praise and we say thank you in Jesus' name. And Lord, lastly, I ask that you would heal every soul that's in this building. Somebody standing here and needs a healing, Lord. And they just didn't say anything, but Lord, we want you to send your healing power. Touch us from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. Anyone who's preparing for surgery, Lord, I want you to go before them. Go before them. And be a healer in Jesus' name. And we say thank you. Can you give God a great big hand clap of praise? Amen. Can you do me a big favor? Even as you're standing, can you get your hands on an offering or your electronic device to give an offering? Uh, we're going to take up. Do we have any announcements that we need to make while we're preparing to do the offering? Uh, do know that um, I, I, I have not said this to you, but of course we have Cash App. Cash App to give. You can give with Cash App. You can give with text to give. The church actually prefers that you would give with Cash App because there's no fee for that. The text to give, there's a small fee. 
we're not complaining either way, right? But, um, but if you can give by cash app, praise the Lord, that'd be great. But we also have the text to church, text to give, um, where you would text, there it is on the screen, any dollar amount to 84321, the cash app sign, um, what's it called, sign on or cash app is dollar sign HCH give, that's cash app, dollar sign HCH give. Go ahead, Pastor, yes. Once you have your offering ready and prepared, and if you'd like to give um, in person uh, with, with a check or with a dollar amount, we have uh, offering envelopes. You just raise your hand. The ushers will be able to bring you that. And then we're going to lift up the offering. All right, just lift your, right, lift your offering in your right hand. If, you're, if, you have a, if you did it on your phone, lift your phone in your right hand. If you, however you did it, amen. Thank God for technology. Hey, you know, in the church, technology used to be the devil. <laughs> Amen. I thank God for technology. Amen. All right. So we're just going to lift it up, ask God to bless you and bless the offering. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you and we give you praise. We give you glory, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for not only for giving, we thank you for having it to give. I thank you for bless, blessing every soul to have to give. I'm asking, Lord, that as we give, that it not return void. Lord, I'm asking that as we, as we pour out, you would pour back in. And Lord, use these monies for the upbuilding of your kingdom, for the tearing down of Satan's kingdom, for the building up of the body of Christ. And Father, multiply our tithes, multiply our offerings. And Lord, I'm asking also that you would continue to bless this, um, this uh, sanctuary project that we're doing with these contractors. We ask that you would allow everything to go smoothly and Lord, that there would always be peace. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.